Good morning and welcome to Iron Shop and Iron, our interactive Bible study conference line, a safe and sacred place where we gather from the north, the south, the east, and the west to learn, to study, and grow in the Word of God. Workmen that needs not to be ashamed, but one can rightly divide the Word of truth. This is Minister Brindy, a facilitator from Northern California, and we're leader-led by Pastor Douglas Banks out of Columbia, Maryland. We're so thankful and grateful that you're here with us today. We're currently in the study of the book of Daniel. We will be covered in prayer this morning by Sister Gloria out of Oregon. Good morning, Sister Gloria. Good morning. Good morning, Minister Brenda and everyone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, to say good morning, Father. Good morning. This is a new day that you have allowed us to wake up in and be refreshed in and and come on the line to hear what does say. So we want to thank you this morning, Father, for your goodness and your mercies upon our life. We want to thank you for the strength and your breath that's within our lungs. We want to thank you for Minister Brenda's um, keeping the line decent and in order. We want to thank you for Pastor Father, who your Holy Spirit moves through to uh, expound upon your word for us to um, get more of the nuggets. We ask, Father, that as we go forth this morning, our hearts will be receptive to what you have to say, Father. Our ears will hear what what, um, you want us to hear, Father, that we may not only live your word, Heavenly Father, but that we can share it with those about us, Father, that you want us to speak with and share with, Father. So we ask that our um, ears be open, our eyes see, our heart be receptive, and that your Holy Spirit just continue to move through Pastor and through this line, Father, that for all that hears, whether it be this morning or on the recordings, Father, that they hear what you want us to hear, Father, and help us to live our life, Father, that um, with faith and strength and knowing that you are always with us, Father. So we thank you again for this platform that we can come together from the north, south, east, and west, Father. Come together as one, Father, to to worship you, to say thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us, Father, for all that you allow in our lives, Father, that, that help us to grow in our faith and help us to have a better relationship with you, Father. So we want to say thank you. And I ask that you be with all that is not able to be on the line this morning for whatever reason it may be, Father, that they go and they listen to the recordings later, Father, and, and it builds their strength strength and it builds their their faith, Father, in you. So we thank you again, Lord, for this platform, for this new day, and for your tender mercies upon our life to be able to um, grow in you. Be with Pastor as he um, gives the word, we pray in Jesus' name. We say thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Gloria. Thank you for leading us once and again into the very presence of the living God. We we consider blessings uh, to all who have come with ears to hear and heart to understand uh, that we are standing beneath the ark of safety. We are in the tower of God. He covers us with his manifest presence, and we are able uh, to be enjoined to his glory Uh, along with the angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Because we come in agreement with the very word of God, we're able to walk in the favor of our Father which art in heaven. And so we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We thank you for once again giving us a new day uh, that we might praise the name of Jesus and walk in the word of God. So I want to uh, start us off this morning um, with an illustration. I I heard a story about a man uh, who was in uh, the barber shop. He was getting a a haircut and getting his beard trimmed uh, in that barber shop. And uh, as the barber was uh, cutting his hair and shaping him up, 
they were holding conversation one with another, and uh, the barber says uh, to the man, you know something, I don't believe in this God. Uh, how could there be God? There's so much pain in this world. There's so much evil going on, so much bad behavior. This, this world is just terrible. How could there possibly be a good God? And so the uh, the patron who's getting his hair cut says, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I understand that. Uh, it's for that reason that I don't believe in barbers. I do not believe in barbers or barber shops. Uh, there's so many people with long hair. I see people with dirty hair. I see people with unkempt hair. I see people with all kinds of ways they misuse uh, their hair. It's just ridiculous. So there could not possibly be any barbers. There couldn't be any barber shops. So the barber says, what are you talking about? Those people that, are, that have unkempt hair and too long hair, dirty hair, that's because they don't come to me. If they came to me, I would take care of it, and they would be all right. And the patron says, yeah, that's true. And it's the same thing with our Father, which are in heaven. Uh, if they would just come to him, if they would just come to God, he would take care of it, and everything would be all right. So we are going to continue our study in the book of uh, Daniel, and to everybody's joy and happiness, as iron sharp as iron, we are going to have a pop quiz this morning, uh, and I know everybody is thrilled about that. You get a chance to see all the knowledge you've acquired. Uh, before we go into Daniel chapter 9, we know, for example, that uh, in Daniel chapter 8, uh, we read about this second vision of Daniel that he saw, and we know that he saw a ram with two horns, and that ram uh, uh, represented the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, would someone get Daniel 8? Daniel 8 and read verses 20 and 21. Daniel chapter 8, uh, verses 20 and 21. Daniel he, chapter Daniel, 8. <laughs> Go ahead. Daniel 20 and 21. Uh, the ram which you saw, having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. 22. Amen. The broken... 21. That's good. That's Amen. good. That's all. 20 and 21. So this king, um, that's the king of Greece, this uh, goat that's flying through the land, uh, who does that goat uh, or that that king of Greece represent? Who was, uh, who was mentioned there? Who is that person? Is it Satan? Was it no. answer? Okay, the ram is with the two horns. They are the kings of Media and Persia. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we're talking about Cyrus the king, um, and uh, Cyrus the king, and we're talking about the. Um, uh, what's his name, the king of the, the Medes that uh, came in to uh, conquer uh, Babylon. And so that's who we're talking about here, um, Darius and Cyrus. But the one who conquered and established the Greek Empire, the king of the Greek Empire, who came after them, and establish the Greek culture. Or what was his name? Is that Antiochus? No, that was Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great established the Greek Empire. He was the one who ran through the Medo-Persian Empire, knocking off everyone, 
uh, before he was 33 years old, he established the Greek Empire in Africa and Asia, all throughout the continent. Uh, Alexander the Great was the one who established the Greek Empire. Now, this person uh, that a couple of you have mentioned, Antiochus Epiphanes the Fourth. Antiochus Epiphanes the Fourth was the one who foreshadowed and was the first mention of someone that was to come. Who did he uh, foreshadow? Satan. Close. The Antichrist? The Antichrist, exactly. He foreshadowed the Antichrist. Antiochus Epiphanes IV um, foreshadowed the Antichrist. If somebody would stay here, Daniel 8, uh, verses 23 and 24. Verses 23 and 24. Would somebody read that? This is Sheila. I'll read it. Daniel eight twenty-three. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are, are come to the full, a king of fierce Continents and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. 24, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper. Wonderf- and shall prosper and pr- practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Amen. So this is uh, the little horn of Daniel that he rose up to challenge God. Uh, and, and somebody said he was also called the Antichrist. That's what John called him. John called him the Antichrist. John called him the beast. And so uh, Daniel here is lifting up this little horn that rises up to challenge God. And he was called the Antichrist by John. Um, and then St. Paul called him something else. What does St. Paul call this little horn, this Antichrist? Paul had a name for him. Uh, what did Paul call him? Is it the son of perdition? Is that, that it? Yes, the son of perdition. Paul called him the son of perdition. He called him the lawless one. And so this this person is the same person. I just want to be clear to you that this little horn of Daniel that rose up against God is also called the Antichrist by John. He is also called the son of perdition, the lawless one uh, by Paul. Uh, let's take a look. Second Thessalonians 2. Somebody get uh, second. Thessalonians 2, uh, verse 7 through 9. Somebody would read that for us. Okay. This is Gloria. I have 2 Thessalonians 2. Okay. Um, seven through nine and in the NIV it reads excuse me my eyes seven it says for oh, yeah. the secret power excuse me for the secret power of the lawlessness is ready already at work. But one who holds now the back will continue to do so Till he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of confederate Miracles, signs, and wonders, the word of God. Amen. So it will be counterfeit 
signs and wonders, lying wonders. And so this lawless one will be empowered by Satan, and he is the Antichrist, and he is the son of perdition. And this is uh, in the Old Testament called the little horn that Daniel sees rise up against God. Okay, what is the rapture? What is the rapture? It's when God takes the people who know him uh, are taken up into heaven. Amen. Amen. It's when Jesus comes for those who know him. Would somebody get 1 Thessalonians 4? 1 Thessalonians 4 and read verses 13 through 18. This is Minister Brenda. I have it. First Thessalonians 4, verse number 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Leash you sorrow as others who have no hope. And if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even to God, will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Amen, the word of God. Amen. So Jesus will burst the sky with the voice of an archangel. Now, we know uh, in our Bible is listed two archangels. What are, what are their names? Michael and Gabriel. Michael and Gabriel. Uh, also, the books of the Apocrypha list uh, some more archangels. How many are listed in the Apocryphal book? Seven. Is there seven? Seven. 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 Yeah, so so in our Bible there are two in the apocryphal books, uh the historical account, they list seven archangels. Also, the Bible lists many things that are familiar to us in order to help us understand spiritual and heavenly things that are unfamiliar to us. Um, these are usually parables uh, so that we will understand or begin to understand what God is doing. Uh, Jesus, especially in the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus taught very often in parables so that we could begin to grasp unfamiliar things uh, by giving us familiar illustrations. One-third of the teachings of Jesus Christ are parables. It's one of his favorite ways of teaching us. Does anybody uh, have an, a remembrance of any of the parables of Jesus Christ? Uh, yes. The sower? The sower, yes. What what was that about? That was a farmer going out and throwing seeds into his field, and uh, some of the feed, seeds will take and some of them won't. Some of them will start out and then get overgrown by weeds, and uh, others will just die right away, and then some will produce. Exactly. So what did that mean? What does that mean? That was really <laughs> that was really talking about uh, the word falling on people 
ears us being preached to. And even some of us, when we receive the word, it takes root and then it gets taken away by the cares of the world. And then sometimes it just rolls over us like water and it doesn't stick. And then some of us hear the word and start to produce, go out and tell others and do the works of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Exactly. What about the parable of the prodigal son? What was that? Any Anyone? What was the parable of the prodigal that son? When, that was when the son uh, wanted his inheritance and, um, and it was not due time for him to have it. So he gave it to him anyway, and the son went off and uh, got drunk and was rolling around in cake size and stuff like that. But he came back home humbly and asked his father if he could come back, and his father accepted him. Amen, exactly. And so what does that mean to us? I think it means that we should be uh, be able to forgive people uh, for what they've done, you know, for things that they have done to us and, and, uh, and found the way back. I think yes, and and and, and what else? Uh, Not, say I, again. I and it I also shares the steadfast love of the Lord for us, and His longing yeah. love for us. Exactly, we, we can come back to the Father, even if we mm-hmm. sin, right? Even if we sin, even if we we uh, go astray, uh, when we come back to God, He will receive us, right? So Jesus was teaching us loss and redemption. Sin and salvation. Um, and uh, one more. Remember when Jesus said, "I am the vine, and you are the branches. That he who yeah. abides in me, and I in him, shall bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing." What What does that mean? That a branch that's not connected to the tree or the root is going to die, and it can't produce any yeah. fruit. So we have to stay connected to Jesus to stay uh, healthy and fruitful and productive. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. We must stay connected to Jesus Christ because all of our nourishment, all of our life comes from him. Absolutely. And so we are to grow. uh, We are to live forever. We live in connection to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. How about All right. that? Do not judge. The judge. Do not judge, or you be a, will be judged. And what does that mean? That is, do not. It, basically, you don't judge anyone <clears throat> on anything that they do. Basically, because you can be judged. You know, it's like um, when he said something about. Uh, the plank in someone else's eye or the speck in someone else's eye, your, the plank is bigger in your eye, something like that. Yes, yes. So we don't, we're not the judge of mankind. Uh, we, we don't take God's place. God is the judge of mankind, not us. Uh, yeah. And so uh, the Bible says with the same measure that you use, to judge someone else, it will be measured again to you. And so if you uh, decide to put yourself in the place of God and judge others, uh, God will judge you with that same measuring stick. Uh, You chose to put yourself in the place of the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Very good. Good, good, good. So we are going to now go into... uh, Chapter 9, we're going to begin with uh, some background so we will know clearly where we are. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, reads in this wise, that in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 
70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. All right, we want to dig into that right away. First year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the lineage of the Medes, the, the Medes king, the king of the Medes. He was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. He took over Babylon. And so we're going to look at the timeline as we go into chapter 9. Chapter 9 is the first year of Darius. Let's look at uh, Daniel 7 and verse 1. Daniel 7 and verse 1. says that in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main fact. So when we open up uh, chapter 7, Daniel is recalling the first year of Belshazzar, the first year. So this is a flashback. This is a flashback to that first year of this king, Belshazzar. Would somebody here now read uh, verses 7 and 8? In, in chapter 7 here, verses 7 and 8. I'll read. This is Reverend. I'll, I'll read, read it. it. What? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, 7. seven and Hello? It says... Mm-hmm. After this, mm-hmm. I saw in visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. Amen. Amen. All right. So this is the first year of Belshazzar, uh, king of Babylon. Daniel has this vision, and he sees this little horn, this little horn that... uh, has pompous words and arrogant words against the Almighty God. This is the first year of Belshazzar. Daniel is a a young man, a very young man at this time. And so we get this flashback. Now let's go to uh, chapter 8, chapter 8 of Daniel and verse 1. Uh, And... Chapter 8 of Daniel, in verse 1, it says that in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. So this is a couple of years later. This is the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. And so this is a flashback as well uh, while he is under the Babylonian rule. If somebody would read uh, here in chapter 8, verses 2, just continue verses 2 through verses, verse 12, 2 through 12. This is, this is Gloria, Gloria, and I have it through 12, NIV. Go ahead. Melba, go ahead. Oh, okay. 2 through uh, 12. Um, I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was in Sushin, the citadel, uh, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision that I was by the river Eula, Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, which had two horns. And the two horns were high, 
but one was higher than the other, and the other one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Six, then he came to the ram that that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore, the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, for notable one came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And in it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Twelve, because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Amen. Amen. The word of God. And so he came casting truth down to the ground, and yet he prospered. And then if you're down in uh, verse 15 here, it says uh, the interpretation of what ha- of this vision that Daniel had. In the third year of the reign of of King Belshazzar, this vision. And the interpretation is that when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, he wants to know the meaning of this, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. And so he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the end times, the times of the end. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. That ram, that ram which Daniel saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And so they are um, Cyrus and uh, I keep forgetting the boy's name, the Mede, Darius. Darius and Cyrus. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. And so the male goat is the Greek civilization that has come to take out the Medes and the Persians. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. That's Alexander the Great, who came flying through the, the Africa and Asia, conquering in his wake. 
And then he says, as for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. When uh, Alexander the Great died at 33 years old, not yet 33, four of his generals split up uh, his great empire. Four different kingdoms were set up. Okay, so that's where we are uh, in the third year of King Belshazzar. Uh, Daniel gets this vision of the coming of the Greek Empire. Remember, he is uh, now living in the Medo-Persian Empire, but he knows another empire is coming, and that's the Greek Empire. And so as we go into Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9 and 1, we see that in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, that is of the lineage of the Medes. And so now we're talking about uh, the Medes, the Medo-Persian Empire, the first year. Darius has taken over. He is now ruling for Cyrus. That's the larger horn. That's the one that takes over the Medes. But he is now ruling for Cyrus. Uh, he is king uh, the, over the realm of the Chaldeans. And in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So I wanted us to know the timeline of Daniel chapter 9 is critical because this silver empire, the empire of the Medo-Persians, that has now been defeated. The golden empire, Babylon, has fallen into the hands of the Medo-Persians. And Daniel, he's the one who interpreted the writing on the wall to Belshazzar. Remember, he said, uh, I, I see the writing on the wall. And uh, he was able to interpret it to him, but he did not know, I'm sure, that the uh, revolution would come before the night was over. That very night, uh, the empire shifted into the hands of the Medes and the Persians. So now in chapter 9, we're talking about a time period that was not very long after Daniel uh, came out of the lion's den. He was thrown into the lion's den under Babylon, but he came out. Uh, so this is after he came out of the lion's den, but before uh, King Cyrus took over from Darius. Now Daniel is about 80 years old. He has seen the overthrow of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, he's in the hands of the Medes and the Persians, but he knows something. He knows something from the word of God. And here in uh, 9, chapter 1, Daniel says in verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the book the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And so Daniel here looks to Jeremiah, who has prophesied about this time period. He is in under the Medes and the Persians, Darius is ruling right now, but Daniel remembers something. He remembers that Jeremiah has prophesied about this time period, and we find that here in 9. And so let's take a quick look at what Jeremiah prophesied about this time period. Uh, somebody would get Jeremiah 25 and read verses 8 through 14. Jeremiah 25, verses 8 through 14. 
This is Cynthia, and I can read Jeremiah 25, verse 8 of the New King James. And it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this will this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then it will come to pass, when seventy years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I will bring on that land all my words, which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in the book which Jeremiah has prophesied concerning all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall be served by them also, and I will repay them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. Amen, the word of God. Amen. So here, Jeremiah is prophesying that Israel will go into captivity under King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Uh, even though Israel doesn't want to hear it, they, they have turned against the word of God. They turned against Jeremiah. They wanted Jeremiah dead. They did not like the things he was saying. Uh, They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to live like they wanted to live, regardless of the fact that it was against the word of God. And so Jeremiah told them, well, you turn against God, you're going to be conquered. And you're going to be conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. Named him. You're going to be conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king of Babylon, and you are going to go into captivity and serve these heathens. Uh, Then he gives a time period. You're going to serve them for 70 years. He prophesies that you're going to serve them for 70 years. And Daniel knows this. He knows what Jeremiah has prophesied, and he knows at this time, he's about 80 years old at this time, and he knows uh, that they have already been under the dominion of these uh, pagans for roughly uh, 67 years or so. Uh, and so he knows that the time is short. According to the word of God, they are going to be set free soon. Soon. And the New American Commentary, uh, Stephen Miller explains this. He says, as Daniel studied Jeremiah's prophecy, he came to realize that the 70-year captivity period was drawing to a close. Uh, And so we look at this passage, two things leap out at us. First, Daniel recognized Jeremiah's word as the word of God. Somebody asked a few days ago, uh, why is the Apocrypha not in our Bible, uh, and why uh, did we pick the books that we picked as the canon? Well, we have to be absolutely sure when we pick books that they were inspired of God, uh, that we go all the way back to someone who we know and can verify heard the word of God. And so we know here that Daniel is accepting the word of Jeremiah as scripture. During this time, there were many false prophets, there were many pagans, Uh, going all around, but Daniel was able to discern that Jeremiah was not only a true prophet, but what he wrote down uh, was considered scripture. And and so when you're right in line, um, you're living at the same time as someone who is a true prophet, uh, and you recognize it as the word of God. That's very, very important. Peter uh, did the same thing about Paul. He lived at the same time, but he recommended uh, and and established 
and could see clearly that Paul had been called uh, by God. Let's let's take a look at uh, 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. Uh, somebody would read verses uh, 15 through 18. 2 Peter 3, verses 15 through 18. Second Peter three fifteen through eighteen out of the uh, New King James version of the Bible read and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all the epistles speaking in them of these things in which we are some things hard in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware at least you also fall from your own steadfastness being led away with the error of the wicked, 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. The word of God. Amen. So thank you. So Peter testifies uh, that Paul is a man of God and has uh, and is writing scripture. And Way back with Daniel, he lived uh, during the time of Jeremiah, and he testified that Jeremiah is a man of God, and what he's writing is the word of God. Okay, so we're going to close there today, but we are we are starting on 9, um, and I wanted to make sure that timeline is clear, that they are now under uh, the silver realm. They are under the Medes and the Persians, uh, but still in captivity. Daniel recognizes that the time period for them to be in captivity is coming to an end. Okay, questions, conflicts, or concerns about anything we've gone over this morning? So, Pastor, this is Minister Brenda. So, what I'm hearing and seeing is they were in captivity because they were being disobedient unto God. They were not uh, following his rules. And God allowed them to be taken into captivity. But the people that took them into captivity, they were harsh and cruel. They went over uh, over the top with uh, what they were doing to the people, to the Israelites, to the people. So then God is also punishing them as well. Amen. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Just because they're turned over to your hand doesn't give you the right to be evil and cruel and vicious toward them. Yes. God said, I will turn you over to them, and they are going to be vicious, mean, and cruel, and I will punish them for their unrighteousness the same way I'm punishing you for your unrighteousness, turning away from me. And so we'll we'll start with that tomorrow. Uh, Moses made it very clear that this was going to happen. As long as you follow God, God is going to bless you. Uh, But when you turn away from God, the curses uh, will fall upon you. Moses made that very clear in Deuteronomy 28. And so uh, this is what happened to them, and it is definitely what happened to Babylon and to uh, the Persians eventually as well. Uh, Even though King Cyrus did a very good thing, and we'll read about that in the future. Good good, good morning. Yes. This is Adrian. I wanted to ask, during this time period, did people still live extra long years compared to what we think today? Because we're saying Daniel is about 80 years old. So when we expect as we continue to read, he lives as long as like 120, 150 years. What we notice uh, in the Old Testament that 
as a populations grew uh, and wickedness abounded and sinfulness became more prevalent in the earth, uh, people lived shorter and shorter periods. In the beginning, when uh, the spirit was very strong and there was not that many people, people were living to 900 uh, 800, 700 years. They were living a long time. The Spirit of God was resting mightily in those few people. But as we gained more and more people and more and more wickedness, uh, we went from um, that to eventually God saying 120 years. That's that's it. That's what you're going to get. And then if you keep going uh, further, you're going to see 70 years. And if by way of strength, maybe 80. And so as wickedness grows, life diminishes. So that really speaks of the fruit of your lips, because if you're speaking out evil all the time, you're bringing it upon yourself versus someone who's speaking life, bringing more life into their body. Amen. Amen. Uh, Life and death is in the power of the tongue. The Bible is clear about that. We speak life to life. We speak death to death. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. So we recommend people speak life. Anyone else? Okay, if not, would someone uh, pray for us? The Sister Phyllis, and I'll pray us out. Thank you, Heavenly Father, God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, Yeshua Christ. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to delve deeper into understanding so that we form a closer relationship to you, to be tied closer to the vine so that we can produce more fruit. Lord, I ask you to bless everyone on this line, every family that's represented. Touch each one of us and let us be well, healthy, and strong for the work ahead. Lord, I ask you to touch Pastor Banks, Minister Brenda, lift them up, give them strength, and give them joy for this day. And, Lord, as we leave this space but never your presence, we say thank you, amen, and hallelujah, and bless your precious son that you sent to save us, Yeshua. We ask all these things in his name, amen, and amen. 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 Thank you, sis. Be blessed, beloved. Amen.